So I'd like to ask the question today, are you fit for the kingdom of God? Are you fit for the kingdom of God? We see Jesus here, um, a Jewish man walking through Samaritan land. And it says that the Samaritans didn't receive him. Now, to understand a little bit of the history between the Jews and the Samaritans, they're basically arch enemies, really. They didn't like each other at all. And Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, which was the, the capital of Jerusalem. It was the centre of worship um, for the Jewish people. He was passing through Samari um, Samaritan land, and they didn't receive him. In one sense, they'd already prejudged who Jesus was. That they'd made a decision thinking, oh, he's a Jewish man, he must be like this, this and this. Our ancestors, we've had trouble with the Jews for, you know, hundreds of years. And here's another Jew and he's on his way to Jerusalem. You know, he's someone there that we can just ignore and not even stop to ask who this Jesus is. They prejudged him. I just wonder how many people in our culture prejudge Jesus. You know, often... You might speak to someone about Jesus and, you know, offer them a tract or try and have a conversation with them and, um, you know, quite politely say, I'm not, I'm not interested, not interested, mate, yeah? I don't believe that stuff. I don't want any, any of that stuff, yeah? I'm not into all that. I don't want it. But the question is, is, is into all what stuff? Which stuff don't you actually want? That's the, the problem, is that people have prejudged who Jesus says, you're coming in the name of Jesus. And they say, I don't want it, before you've even fully explained what it is that you're trying to, to tell people about. You know, people have had bad experiences, I'm not belittling that, bad experiences of the church. People have perhaps been involved in the church, they've seen hypocrisy, they've been hurt by people within the church. They've seen, either, you know, experienced themselves, sadly, or at least read it in the newspapers, um, about people in the church abusing their position of authority for all sorts of heinous crimes. So no one wants that stuff. Who wants that stuff? Nobody wants that stuff. But the stuff of Jesus, if you really understand the stuff of Jesus, then everyone wants that stuff. Jesus didn't come to, to bring us abuse in the church or hypocrisy. In fact, the whole reason he came was because of these evils, so that he could save us from these things and he could bring us his life. He came to deal with evils and to bring us the blessings of God. So when people say, I'm not interested in all that, I guess the challenge is, is well, let's have a look before you prejudge who Jesus is. Let's have a look and just see um, what Jesus offers to bring. So saying you're not interested in that stuff would mean that you're not interested in you knowing your creator. Saying that you're not interested in all that stuff would be to say that you're not interested in, in knowing God himself, knowing his blessing upon your life, knowing his provision upon your life. Knowing that there's always someone there that you can call out to in times of trouble. And he promises always to come and to help you out. Knowing that if you're struggling with an illness, that you can cry out to him and ask him to heal you. Knowing that there's someone who's got a wonderful plan for your life and will guide you through life into good things. Rather than just bumbling up and making your own mistakes. But you've got someone who you can come to know. Someone who loves you, who cares for you. That stuff includes having a peace in your heart, joy in your heart, knowing that you are loved by the creator of the universe. When you know that stuff, you do want that stuff really. Every human being actually wants to know that they're loved and cherished. And we can know that we're loved by God himself. What would you rather have in the life to come? I've spoken about some of the blessings, about what it means when you come to know Jesus walking through this life. But what about the life to come? I'm not interested in that stuff. Really? What would you rather have? An eternity of health and blessing or an eternity of suffering? What would you rather have? An eternity full of joy or an eternity full of torment and misery? 
What would you rather have? An eternity in God's light or an eternity in darkness? When someone says, I'm not interested in that stuff, they really don't know what stuff they're talking about that they're claiming not to be interested in. If you can have your eyes opened and actually see the realities of what Jesus is offering us, if we actually realise that we're, we're already in the situation, then we will be very interested in the stuff that Jesus has got. So we see the Samaritans had prejudged Jesus, and then we see the disciples' reaction, uh, basically wanting to call down fire. Verse 54, if you look on your sheet there. Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So they're, they're angry. They've seen how glorious Jesus is. They've seen the beauty of Jesus and the blessings of following Jesus and where Jesus is leading them to life. And we've got these people who've come in and prejudged Jesus and in a sense offended the one that the disciples loved. Their reaction is, Lord, send fire down upon them. Bring, in effect, bring judgment. Will you not call down judgment upon these, these people? The fact is, is that we all will face judgment. We'll all have to face God one day. We'll have to give an account for our lives. We'll have to explain our sinful actions. Why we lived for ourselves rather than living for the glory of God and the good of other people. Why we took those selfish decisions, those things that hurt other people, those things that offended Almighty God. We'll all have to stand before God. We all deserve to, to have the fire of God upon us, the anger of God upon us, the judgment of God upon us. But did you notice what Jesus did to the disciples? He says he turned and he rebuked them. He told them off. He said, look, don't be too hasty to bring judgment upon these people. You know, God's not a God who just flies off the handle at anything comes down angry at any little transgression and is there to come and, and to squash people. The Bible says that God is merciful and gracious, that he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's patient with us. By rights, we've offended him, we've hurt other people, we've rejected God. By rights, he should send the fire of judgment upon us but is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He gives people an opportunity, he gives people time to repent, to rethink our ways, to realise that we've hurt God, but to also realise that through Jesus Christ there's a way to get right with God. There's a way to have peace with God, there's a way to be forgiven, there's a way to be given a new start and a new beginning, as the Bible describes it as being born again. The way that God has done this is through the cross. Did you notice where Jesus was going when he's passing through Samaria? Verse 53 says he, his face was set towards Jerusalem. It said earlier on in this same chapter in Luke's Gospel that he described himself the Son of Man. He's talking about himself. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he was predicting that he needed to go to Jerusalem. And the reason he was going to go to Jerusalem was because he knew that he was going to be crucified. He was going to be killed on a cross by the Romans. But he also knew that he was going to be buried. And he also knew on the third day he was going to be raised back to life. Thus proving that he truly is the Son of God. To be fit for the kingdom of God, you've got to start with the cross. You've got to come to the cross of Jesus Christ. You've got to come and realise that we deserve the punishment for our sin. But Jesus Christ came in, in the world's greatest exchange that's ever been known. That he came and he took the punishment for our sin. He took our wrongdoing upon himself and was, was punished by God on the cross so that we could escape eternal punishment. And in the exchange, he takes our sin but he gives us his righteousness and he gives us his life. He was raised again on the third day, resurrected to life. And anyone who puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ 
can be transformed by that same resurrection power that they can be born anew and receive a new life in God. But we need to have faith. We don't want to reject that stuff. We need to realise that that stuff's true. The promises of God are true. And we need to reach out in faith and receive it and believe that Jesus died for us and believe that Jesus can give us a new life. And so we see the, the verses 57 to the end, three different types of people and how their faith in Jesus, different obstacles really, which show us what type of faith we need to have if we are to be fit for the kingdom of God. So verse 58, first of all, this guy comes up and says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Wonderfully, he's got a desire in his heart to follow Jesus. He's seen something about Jesus. He's, he's seen the blessings that you can have in Jesus and he wants it. He's seen the blessings not only in this life but in eternity. And he, he wants to follow Jesus. He desires Jesus. He's seen something of the glories of God. But this man's problem was that he, he hadn't counted the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. So look, verse 58. Jesus says to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Basically what he's saying to the man is, if you want to follow me, rest assured, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be hardship. There's going to be trouble. You're going to have to sacrifice everything, actually, to follow the Lord Jesus. That's the type of faith. When someone's got the type of faith that, that sees the blessings of following Jesus outweighing completely any earthly blessing that you could ever receive, that's the type of faith that's fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? If we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to count the cost. We've got to take up our cross. If you want to follow Jesus, people will ridicule you. They'll scoff at you. They'll mock you. They'll reject you. And the Bible even promises that they'll hate you. Have you seen something in Jesus that's worth going through all that? That you're willing to go through all those things? Because you've seen that he's real and that his blessings are real. People will stand against you. We read about our brothers and sisters around the world who are, who are actively persecuted. We get it in a mild form. But some people, their, their careers are ruined. Their property is destroyed. Even their relatives are killed. Or they themselves might be tortured and killed. Have you counted the cost? Do you still want to follow? Have you got that type of faith? That type of faith that makes you fit for the kingdom of God? You think in just regular terms, <clears throat> the Bible often uses these illustrations about the Christian life, about being like a, an athlete or a soldier or a farmer. You may watch the athletics on TV and think about the glory. Think about stood there on the top step with your gold medal listening to God Save the Queen and everyone in, in the UK clapping you. But do you think about the early mornings? Do you think about going running in the rain, in the dark? Do you think about the strict diet that you'll have to go through? Do you think about all those social engagements that you'll have to put aside to win something of the glory? You had someone to die. Film it. To, um, to win that prize. Or what about being a soldier? The respect, the kudos, the uniform, polishing your, your brass buttons, yeah? Even the provision of being in the army, all your needs looked after, as much as you can eat in the army. Do you just think about the glory or do you count the cost? 
what it actually means to be there when you've not eaten for two days and you've bunkered into a place where people are taking pot shots at you. We've got to count the cost. Or what about the farmer? You, think, you might think about the riches of the farmer. You might think about if I could have all these, these fields and these herds and all these riches. But did you consider the times of disease? Did you consider what it's like to be on a hillside when, when the snow is driving in your face and everyone else is indoors, sat in front of the fire? There are many glories to certain occupations in life. And there truly are some wonderful, awesome glories <coughs> for the Christian. But the one who's going to be fit for the kingdom of heaven, the one that will receive these glories, is the one who's counted the cost. We see another person in verse 59 that Jesus calls and, and says, come and follow me. But he says, Lord, let, let me first go and bury my father. There's nothing wrong with burying your dad. But Jesus says to this man, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus isn't rebuking him for burying his dad. That's not a sin to bury your father. But what he's doing is he's, he's challenging him about who is first in your life. If you're going to have the, be fit for the kingdom of God, you've got to have a faith that puts Jesus first in absolutely everything. You've got to have a faith to realise the privilege of what it means to be called by God to follow Jesus and to serve God. Luke 14, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So what Jesus is saying there is that to be a Christian doesn't mean you've got to actually go around and hate all those people in your family. But it's a relative thing. That your love for God, your love for Jesus, when you compare that to, to the, the love that you might have for your nearest and dearest, it's like a hatred because the love for God is so strong. Jesus was challenging this man to concentrate on the things of eternity. You know, there'll always be someone in the world who will do worldly things, earthly things, earthly occupations. But if God calls you to come out of the world and to serve him and to proclaim the kingdom of God, are you going to say no? Or are you going to say, hang on God, can I just do this first or whatever? Do we realise the privilege of what it means to be called by Almighty God to come and follow him. Imagine if the Queen wrote you a letter and said, Look, I want you to give up your occupation and come and serve me in the palace. I'll provide everything for you. It'd be a bit insulting to say, Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, love, I'm not really into all that. I don't really want to do it. But imagine that times infinity. We're talking about the God of the universe asking us to come and follow him. So that we might serve him. Not in common occupations. Although we do serve God in what we do. But we've got a greater calling. We're the ones who've come to see the kingdom of God. And if we're going to be fit for the, the service of God. We need to put that above absolutely everything that we have in our lives. And then lastly we get this guy in verse 61. I will follow you Lord. But... <laughs> I will follow you, but. You know, following Jesus, there are no conditions. We're not trying to enter some sort of agreement that, like, Jesus says, you know, I want you to follow me, and if you follow me, I'll give you all these things. And you say, yeah, okay, I'm happy to follow you, but I want to put this clause in, this clause in, this clause in, this clause in, this clause in. It doesn't work like that. If you're going to be fit for the kingdom of heaven, you realise that, that when Jesus called you, it's a great privilege and you're just going to go and follow him. You've got to follow on Jesus' terms. <coughs> Basically, he's saying, if you want to find eternal life, follow me. If you're not bothered and you want an eternity of darkness and misery and a life without God that doesn't mean anything, then don't follow me. There's no negotiation. 
The one who follows Jesus Christ can't have a foot in both camps. You can't say, well, I want to keep a bit of the world and my old life, but I also want this new life in Jesus. You can't have a foot in both because they're moving in opposite directions. You may be very good at the splits, but at one point it's really going to hurt. Yeah. Choose. Do you want your life and the things of the world? Or do you want the life of God and the things of Christ? There's no buts if you want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, verse 62, No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You walk in your way. The Lord Jesus calls you. He says, turn around and follow me. If you're going to be fit for the kingdom of God, you've got to turn around and you've got to face the Lord Jesus and you've got to keep walking, following him all the way into heaven itself, into eternity. He says you're not fit if you keep looking over your shoulder. You keep drawn back to the, the pleasures and the sins that you used to be involved in. You're not fit, if that's the case, for the kingdom of God. The one who's fit fixes their eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and just follows him. Is so taken by his glory and his beauty and the blessings that he gives us. Why would you be interested in what you've just left behind? So the challenge is, is are you fit for the kingdom of God? Do you believe that God's kingdom is real? Do you believe that following Jesus firstly to the cross and then out from the cross is the only way to come in to the kingdom of God? Are you willing for the whole world to hate you because of your allegiance to Jesus? Are you willing to forsake everything, every worldly occupation, every success, that if the Lord tells you to leave it behind, you're willing to let go of it so that you might serve him freely? Are you willing to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and resolutely, looking to him and never looking back? If you are, then you are indeed fit for the kingdom of God.